we continue in worship this morning, would you please open your Bibles to Revelation? And everyone says, what? What is going on? Yes, I'm going to throw you a curveball. Wait, it's football season, right? I'm going to, we're going to play the, the Statue of Liberty play. There it is, all right? Who played football in the street when they were kids? Statue of Liberty play, you throw the quarterback you hold the ball and someone runs behind you and grabs it <laughs> worked every time now it probably didn't work at all so we're going to uh, uh look at this passage you know last week we talked about uh, preached on the, the importance of of dealing with temptation you and i are humans right and i don't have to say as rhetorical have you ever been tempted we understand that paul simply understands that and he was stressing to the corinthians in chapter 10 hey here's what you do to fight this temptation Right? It's coming. They're in this context of the society. There's many within the church who are saying it's okay to, to follow the pagan idols, to eat meat of, of sacrifice to this. And, of course, he's dealing with their conscience and all these things. And he's saying, look, you don't understand that when you go and do that, you're being tempted. You're lowering your standard of, of purity. You're lowering your standard of what God expects. And every time you kind of go, it's not that big of a deal, not that big of a deal. And pretty soon, uh, you don't end up in church anymore. Right? That's kind of what he's stressing. And so he says, you know, you have to maintain and attain uh, instruction, right? You have to know, uh, he says this, and this is, I'm just paraphrasing, reminding you where we are at and, and where we're going. I'll, I'll get to that here in a moment. But he talks about fighting temptation. You have to attain instruction, right? Get a hold of God's word and understand. Then he says, uh, he goes on, he says, remain alert. You and I can be susceptible. If, if, if two people out of the Exodus movement, out of what they say, 10, uh, excuse me, 6 million, I think was, was or excuse me, 2 million, estimated that left the Exodus, the Exodus movement, uh, two made it into the promised land of that group, right? So chew on that's a pretty big number, right? So Paul's, Paul's point there is saying, look, you and I are susceptible to this. Now, we're a New Testament church. We're sealed with the Holy Spirit, but you and I can miss out on God's blessings. Our life could, ultimately, is what he's saying, could come to a quicker end, right? As we, as we dabble in sin, pursue those things. So he says, remain alert, and then he says, you know, stay assured, was the point I said. And, and, and the attribute he puts here is God is faithful, right? If that's not underlined in, in, in uh, chapter 10, uh, verse 12, or excuse me, 13, mark it. God is faithful. It's an attribute that, that the, Paul is, is standing upon. Uh, God will carry us through this. And then uh, the last point I had when he says flee, therefore, he concludes and says flee idolatry. It's an imperative verb. He commands us. And so I said, uh, you know, with the command, be aggressive, right? Don't think it's just by default these things are going to happen, right? Have you ever had, a, you ever had that moment where you think, if I just go to bed and by some osmosis I'll learn this teaching if I just don't do anything? Has anyone ever thought that? One, <laughs> right? Sometimes we think, well, it'll just happen. And Paul's answer to this is, is simply saying it's not going to happen. You have to do something. So he commands this church, hey, be on guard, right? It can be you and us. Uh, we can be susceptible to, the, to this as well. And so as I was looking at this and I thought, uh, you know, I'd like to kind of, what does a church look like that, that kind of mingles with this, that kind of, you know, kind of floats around and is not serious about fighting temptation? What does that look like? And so as I was praying about that this week, I thought uh, we would go to Revelation and look at uh, the church in Pergamum which is a church that, if, if your Bible says this, the top of it is the compromising church. I thought this is by way of example of understanding the importance of this. The same things, we're going to see some parallels of what Paul has been telling this church in Corinth. Here now we see the Savior speaking, Jesus coming and speaking to this church uh, through John. And I think it's very important. As Paul is saying, live aggressive against uh, idolatry, be aware of that. I don't know if you and I are struggling. I know I'm not uh, struggling with pagan worship and pagan things, uh, but we do have idols of our hearts, don't we? And our heart is always in motion. It's either growing closer to Christ or it's growing away from Him. That's what the Bible gives you. There's never a neutral to the heart. There's always an action. Jesus kind of, I think, states that, and I believe it's Matthew 10, where He says, look, you're either for me, Right? Or you're against me. There's no middle ground, right? You're either positively seeking and for Christ or you're against him. 
And so we see this kind of playing out. And, I, and as I'm looking at the church, I want to just encourage us. This is a message of encouragement to you uh, that we would stay the course and fight the good fight. And I believe Jesus gives us some insight. I had a, this quote in my notes here. I thought it was very good. The quote says, it's from Jared Wilson, who said, The devil would love for you to be perfectly happy so long as you're not holy. Right? So long as you're not holy. And Paul's stress to this, this Corinthian church is to come out from that. The same stress that we'll see in this uh, passage here is that we would come out, right? We're in the world, not of the world. That you would take your, your discipleship, your devotion to Christ seriously. I believe the enemy would love to cripple the church today. I think he's, he's used the same tactics over and over and over again. That's why it's important to study church history, right? We see these patterns throughout church history. This is what he's done. We'll see as Paul has grabbed hold of this example of the Exodus movement and brought it into Corinthians, we're going to see an example taken from Numbers brought right into Revelation as Jesus is challenging this church that's compromising. We also learn from this that Jesus is himself, of course, Lord of his church. The church belongs to him. He has redeemed it. He loves it. That's very important for us to understand. It is his church. And if there is a, a trajectory in which we want to set our, our course upon, we want to ultimately end where he tells us this church as a, re, as a reward and what to look forward to, we want to make sure we make heaven, right? We want to know those things. And of course, we know our salvation is secure in Christ and what he has done. But as we live this life and as we lift high the cross, we want to be those who are an example, uh, who are pleasing to Christ in all that we do. So this is the, the, the compromising church. And as I was reading this, I, I had this moment of thinking, and maybe you can write it in your notes, what would the Lord say if he was to come to us? What would he say if Faith Community Bible Church? Right? What compliments? We're going to see him compliment this, this congregation. What criticisms? We're going to see him criticize that congregation. What commands? What do you think Christ would tell us? Because each of us is a follower. If you're a follower of Jesus, you are a part of the church. He's speaking to us. So this is the, the, the compromising church of Revelation. It's chapter 2. and read verses 12 through 17. And it says this. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos, write, These things says he who has a sharp two-edged sword. I know your works. And where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast to my name, and did not deny my faith, even in the days in which Antipas my, was my faithful martyr, who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. But, as our contrast, I have a few things against you, because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, to commit sexual immorality. Thus you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent, or else I will come to you quickly, and I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat. And I will give him a white stone, and on the stone a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. We offer a brief prayer. Lord, thank you again for your goodness, grace, the power of your word. And as we look to it now, I ask uh, Lord, that you would take me out of the way that every thought in life be fixed upon you. We ask that your Holy Spirit would be here teaching us, uh, correcting us, guiding us, uh, Lord, to proper understanding of your word and to proper application. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, I looked at this by way of example because I believe, uh, you know, I've heard these statements that, uh, you know, you become what you worship. I referenced G.K. Bill's book a few times, and hopefully you're getting, hopefully you're not getting tired of it. Uh, I'll probably reference him again, but he's written this wonderful book on you become what you worship. 
And he does the, his, his, I believe it's his doctrinal thesis that, that got into a book form, but um, he writes about the children of Israel and how uh, God commissioned Isaiah to, to go and prophesy to these people that, that they have ears they don't hear, they have eyes they don't see, right? And so on and so forth. And, and there's this command, this idea that, that the Israelites, as they turn from pursuing God, Right? And feeling fully devoted to God as the only true living God, they turn to idols. And, and what he prophet tells Isaiah to prophesy is, in essence, the children of Israel have become just like their idols. They have eyes, but they don't see. They have ears, but they don't hear. And we pick up that language, as Jesus says it, at the end of this passage, doesn't he? He who has ears, let him hear. Those who believe, those who are following, those who are pursuing after Christ, he's speaking to those who can understand it. But I think there's something very important here, right? With a church today, not just an individual can become like their idol. The church as a whole can become what they worship. They're not worshiping the true living God. Well, then they're worshiping something else, right? Which we have to say that's idolatry, which is a sin. Why is this so important that we come back to God's Word, that we read His Word, we study His Word, and we place ourselves under it so that we would be coming and knowing and learning and worshiping the true living God, right? He comes, and Jesus, at the beginning of this passage, He tells them, I know you, right? To all seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3, He says it to all of them. Now, we can, we can simply write that off and say, you know what? Uh, he's omniscient. He's God. Of course he knows you. But the idea that John picks up here is kind of the verb has this idea of intimate knowledge. He's pressing. It's not just that God knows you. He knows everything about you. He knows exactly what's going on in your church. He knows what's going on in your life. He has factual knowledge. Of course, right? He is Christ. And he says, I know. I know you. Christ knows his church. He knows uh, the church in Pergamos here, and he knows Faith Community Bible Church. He knows us, and that's very important as we begin to understand why we need to have a heart that does not compromise. I've called this message a non-compromising church. As we looked at this, instead of just teaching you what they're doing, is to uh, bring out from this and say this is what a non-compromising church looks like. Right? We get some insight here. And what we learn out of this passage and is uh, the, the, this group has and has been for, for I'm not sure how long, but they've been tolerating sin. They've been tolerating sin. They've hold firmly to the truth. They've been called to the truth, even in the midst of opposition. Even with a, a, a Antipas, we don't know much about him, but he's been martyred for the faith and they haven't wavered. There's a good group there. There's a church there. Right? They're standing in the midst of opposition, and yet you have, at the same time, you have a compromise of doctrine. You have a compromise of sin. So what do we learn from this passage? What does a non-compromising church look like? What's our heartbeat? The first thing I put under, under point one, I'm not sure of the points. Oh, yes, good job, Noah. We weren't sure if that was going to be working today. Uh, the first point here, if you have your, your handout, is a non-compromising church. I just put is active. Right? There's an activity. There's a direction. They're going. They're moving. Your faith, it's going. He says in verses 12 through 13, this is where Jesus says some wonderful things about this church. He says, Unto the angel of the church of Pergamos, write, These things says he who has the sharp two-edged sword. I know your works. And where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast my name. And did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my, who, oh, excuse me, was my faithful martyr, who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. Jesus says that they have an active faith. This is a church, right? I, I pray and hope uh, the Lord would say of us and speak of us, that they have an activity, they have a strong belief Right in the, in, the, in the face of opposition, Jesus references two times, this is where Satan dwells. There is a satanic activity all around this church, right? There is a pagan idols, a pagan place, things going on around them. And that's what he's referencing. You're in the, in the context of a lost world. And he says, in spite of this, in spite of the raging things that are happening, you have been faithful. You have not denied my name. I pray that for all of us. Lord, let us live a life every day like this. 
And John says, and as Christ is communicating through him in this letter, he says, this is the thing says he, right? Christ is the author. This is, and he stresses this idea of the sufficiency of Christ, right? As he begins to give this compliment, as he begins to give the critique, he is saying this is the one. Christ alone, right, has a right to tell us, right? He has a right to critique us. He has a right to call us to repentance. He has a right in all these things. John says he has the sharp two-edged sword. It's the word of truth. He speaks that it is true. Jesus' ministry upon the earth, right? When he revealed through action and word who God is, it is truth. He is true. I am the way, the truth, the life. What God says or what Christ says in this passage, it is true. We can bank upon it. We can trust him. And so here we have the activity. We have those trusting in Christ. And we see that this church is a persistent amongst opposition. Is it safe to say that you and I are going to be faced with opposition? Yeah. Jesus never here promises that, hey, I'll take you, I'll take you away. Or he doesn't say, you know what, I'll, I'll deal with them. Or he doesn't say, you know what, we'll just, you know, don't worry about it. He doesn't say it's going to be easy. It's going to be, a, it's going to be, no, it's, it's no problem. No, he doesn't say any, he doesn't promise any of those things. He commends them for being faithful in the midst of opposition. You and I are going to be faced with opposition. You better be determined where your activity, your loyalty lies. A church that is active. We know the, the devil rages and he roars. He's a roaring lion, as Peter tells us. He's waiting and, and just wanting to jump. He wants to make uh, Christians miserable. He would love to see you, as I mentioned earlier, that quote, as you're happy, if you're just happy, it's good. Don't be holy. Don't be in action. Sit on your gifts, your talents, your hands. Don't be doing anything for the kingdom. If he can get you doing that, he has success. But churches, I think if you look at and what is happening in our society, there is a, a way in which we've been timid. Right? So he's saying be active. I mean, at some point they're engaging the culture. The culture knows what they're standing for. One has been martyred for the truth. So it's not like they're saying, let's go run and hide. They're doing some wonderful things. But it stresses, right? God is faithful, even in the midst of satanic power. You see, in 1 John 4.4, 4, I believe this church has understood something here. And John says this, You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because He who is in you is greater than he that's in the world. The church would begin to understand that you're sealed with the third person of the Trinity. That we may not, he may take the opposition away, he may not, but he will be with you in it. Is that not the, the promise that Christ gives his church in the Great Commission? And lo, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. He's not going anywhere. In the face of these things, we know Christ is with us. He desires that his church be active, that we would have a faithful witness. A non-compromising church is serious about the gospel, right? We understand what Christ has done. I mean, we, we know, I think this is a rhetorical question, is, is Satan taking a break? Is he on this coffee break? I like coffee and pie, right? I'll, I'll take a time out for a coffee and pie. I don't think Satan does that, right? He's waiting. And again, remember, he tried to actually uh, cause Christ to fail, do you think he'll leave you alone? Right? Most of us don't face opposition because we're not engaged in the battle. Some of us don't know where the war is at. Right? We need to be a light. We need to get hold of this truth and live it out. I believe too often in, in our society and our culture, the church is saying, you know what, it's, it's just a lot easier to compromise, isn't it? It's just easier not to face opposition. I don't know of anyone who says, man, I can't wait to get in more opposition, right? So where do I sign up for that? Can I have more opposition, please? I understand that's human nature, isn't it? We can, we can identify some of the things of this church here in a moment as we go on, but we see this happening. Don't we, don't, don't we see this happening in our culture? The church is becoming more and more like the culture and not be, being different. That's a story. I remember a pastor one time, he was traveling in Atlanta, as the story goes, and and he was looking for a place to eat, and he was looking through the yellow pages back in, in that time and that day, and, and uh, he didn't have a smartphone, but he goes and he finds this, this restaurant called the Church of God Grill. 
And he thought, that's really interesting. And so he, he decides to call and find out how, this, how their name kind of came to be. And so he calls them. And he gets a hold of a person who understands their history. And he says, well, how did, this, how did your restaurant become, uh, came to be called the Church of God Grill? And the man goes on and explains. He said, well, uh, we had a mission down here. And we would, we would cook chickens and we'd serve chickens and we'd sell them to help pay the bills. And he says, well, as people liked the chicken and business was really good, eventually we just cut back the church service and we closed the church down, but we kept the restaurant going. And we just thought, well, it's best just to keep the name. It's got a good name. Too so often we treat things like this. We just kind of windle away and, and kind of you know, compromise. And I mean, this is Paul's point to the Corinthian church. We may say, yeah, I'm at freedom and I have grace to do these things. But he says, do you not realize that when you participate in this, you're lowering your standard? And every time the church lowers, the next time you lower a little bit more, the next time you lower a little bit more, and pretty soon we look like the rest of the world. And Jesus is saying confidently to this church, this is what you're doing well. Even in the face of opposition, stand for truth. I'll be with you. A non-compromising church is active. Right, with the gospel. And I know that sounds like, oh, I have my knee in your back and I'm pushing you forward, right? But I'm pushing myself forward. I'm a Christian first before a pastor. We're followers of Christ. We have a testimony to share. You've been given gifts and abilities, right, to do a good work. He set good works in front of you. A church needs to get a hold of that. A non compromising church is active. The second thing we see here uh, in verses 14 through 15, and I'm going to say a non compromising church is holy. He says, but, and this is our contrast, I have a few things against you. You almost see how Jesus is kind of, even with the, 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 the critique here, he's, he kind of softens it a little. You almost see his grace with saying, here's what you're doing good. Here's where you're, you're not quite there. He says, but I have a few things against you because you have there those who hold to the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols. And to commit sexual immorality. Thus you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Which thing I hate. So here's what's going on. We have the contrast from the good thing. Even though we have some good followers there. We do see, right, uh, because they're holding on to some bad doctrine. We have folks in the church who are teaching bad things. Wrong doctrine. They're tolerating sin. They're compromising. Now you can see we're human, we understand that. You can imagine if your dear brother was Antipas and he died, you might feel dejected, rejected, and going, I don't, I don't know if I can go, I don't have any more fight in me. Right? You can identify with the human component there, but Jesus says, hey, look, the fight's not over. There is a day, right? He will come. All things will be made new. Stay the course. I don't think this moment, I, you know, as, as Jesus is saying this, I don't think uh, that this is a new revelation to them. I don't think there's, as he's writing this to the church and they're reading it, I don't think they're going, wait, who's doing that? Right? I don't think that's what's happening. I think as they hear this, they're going, yeah, we, we're aware of it. We understand it. Jesus says, I know you. I know everything about you. I have intimate knowledge, right? I don't think they're coming and saying, well, you know, I don't think, I don't think you know, Jim wasn't supposed to teach that, but, it, well, we let it slide. I don't think that's what's going on. I don't know why I picked on Jim, but, but go with that. But what's interesting here is I mentioned earlier the same tactics the enemy has, he continually uses. Right? If, you, if you think for a moment, and I think I put this in your notes if you have those, in Genesis 3, chapter 6, and uh, excuse me, uh, verse 6, 3, 6. Um, there's this moment before Eve has any sin at all, right? She's sinless, and Adam is sinless. How does Satan get someone who is sinless to eat fruit, to disobey God, right? The verse says this, So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her and he ate. I mean, how, do, how does this happen? Without sin, he uses, tempt, right? she's very tempted to lust after something she doesn't have. This, right, I mean, if you're familiar with the passage, Satan says, God doesn't want you to eat that because he knows you'll be like him. Right? It's the original lie. You'll be like God. 
But isn't it interesting? His tactics here are, are simply the idols of our heart. The idol, he sets this in front of her. Here's this thing. You know, eating the fruit wasn't the sin. It was a disobeying God. God said, do not eat of this. And that wasn't a harsh command. He gave them all of the garden. He says, all of it is for yours to enjoy. Just don't eat of this. Because God wants a church that says, you know what? I choose you above my own life. And even though there's temptations and things around me, I'm going to follow you. I'm going to serve you. And yet the enemy comes and the enemy uses the same tactics. The enemy has done this to the Israelites. This is why their bodies were scattered all over. They were tempted away. And here we see the doctrine of Balaam and the teachings of the Nicolaitans. It's the same lie. It's the same sin. It's the same things that trip us up. The idols of our hearts. Satan is doing it in the Corinthians, right? They're going and eating food to pagans. They're going and doing these things. He's calling them out saying, flee, flee, imperative verb, command, flee idolatry. Here Jesus is saying, look, you have these in your church who are teaching these very things. Faulty doctrine, bad doctrine. So we come to this. Come to this problem, we see the disobedience, we see what sin is, it's ignorance, they don't know, it's a violation of God's will, His law. There's a desire, right, for for our own autonomy. I'm independent of God. That's the sin that resonates in the church today. We wouldn't say it like that. We want to come out from under His Scripture. We want to come out from under who He is. We want to have a neck that's stiff, and yet Christ says, come, come to me. Right? Take upon my yoke. It's light. My burden is easy. And yet we will say, no, I want my own way. So here's the sinful problem. I had this in your notes, verse 14. Right? The doctrine of Balaam is a compromise with the idolatrous society. That's what's happening. They've compromised. The, the, the teaching has come into the church. They've allowed it to, to take place. And if you're familiar with Numbers 22, again, we see this where, where Jesus is grabbing the Old Testament, bringing it into the New Testament. You can't understand who the doctrine of Balaam is if you don't have uh, the book of Numbers, right? So he says, look here, this, this is how Balaam, if you're familiar with the story, usually you know it's Balaam's donkey, right? So we know Balaam's donkey. Oh yeah, I know that part, right? The donkey talks to Balaam. And God was going to kill him because he was going to go and, and prophesy over the, the nation of Israel a curse, God says no. When he finally gets there, he doesn't prophesy a curse. They're upset at this. And he tells them, he tells Balak, here's how you get the children of Israel to compromise. You give them your own daughters in marriage. And through lust and idol worship, through the, through the children, through, through the people compromising, this is how you get them. This is how you get them to, to fail. If you're familiar with that story, using the, the pericope of the next passage, you see Israel's great harlotry. It's the same lie. It's the same sin. It's coming into the church. They also have a sinful practice. He mentions the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. What's interesting here is the Nicolaitans were ones that identified as Christians. right? And they were, if you're familiar with this word, a big theological word, antinomian. Right? That sounds important. Now you're following. Oh, he knows something now, right? The word simply means they, were, they, were, uh, they had Christ, they believed they had Christ, but it allowed them to live any way they wanted. They practiced very sinful things. Not much is known of them, but what is known of them? That they practiced uh, uh, sexual impurity. I mean, they practiced you know, sexual practices with prostitutes. They, they identified as, as Christians, and they, and they prayed to pagans. They did whatever they wanted to do within the culture, but yet called themselves, felt they were saved. Jesus says, I hate that. You know, this is amazing because you think about this for a moment. This has infiltrated the church. There's a strong teaching in the church today of antinomy as it was in Paul's day. Paul was charged with this very thing and where people were saying, can't we just sin all the more that God's grace would come all the more? He says this in Romans 6. And he says, no. It's the same charge, the same lie, right? Here it is in the church. We can, we're at free grace. We can do whatever we want. And the teaching of our church, right, is to say, and the teaching of Scripture says, the gospel has given you freedom from sin. It doesn't give you freedom to sin. There are commands of Scripture. There is growth and purity. There is an action to following, coming and dying and following after Christ. It's the cost of discipleship. Yes, we have grace. And it is amazing. But it doesn't give us grace to continue to sin. 
So what's happening in the church? I believe there are some parallels, and I simply call this a hyper, you know, what is a hyper-grace church, right? If you're not familiar with antinomia, that's what it means, a hyper-grace church. What would you see in patterns on the church and the culture today is you would see, one, that the pastor never talks about sin. You can imagine in this church in Pergamos, right? They, they know it's there. They're not really confronting it, are they? Let's just, we've had enough opposition. We lost Antipas, Right? Let's just, let's just call this thing an easy street. Let's not call it sin. Let's compromise. That's what's happening in a lot of pulpits in America. The word sin is used. It's against the legalists or against the Pharisees or something we would say you're delivered from, but we'll never come out and say you're actually a sinner in need of God's forgiveness. Another way would be uh, the culture. They, they never take a stand um, in culture for righteousness. Never stand against the culture for what is right. We see the culture failing. We know the culture is lost. And why are we compromising? We go back to, to Paul and he says, you know, why are, why are you compromising the gospel? The world, we know the world thinks of the cross as foolishness. Why are you inviting them into your church? Take a stand for righteousness. Another one is we see the, the separation, right? The Old Testament is almost totally ignored. That's very popular today. That may shock some of you. Big-time pastors will say we shouldn't read it. Why? Because the culture says it's hard to believe all those stories. And they kind of conclude, yeah, maybe they're not believable. Let's just get rid of it. That's kind of been their answer. Again, Jesus seems to think all that happened. Right? Jesus believed the Old Testament. He said, throw the Old Testament away. I think we have to throw Jesus away. It doesn't make sense anymore. Do you see the problem? It's irrationality. That's what's happening in the church. For I think you have people who live immoral lives, we're allowed to be in leadership. Ah, it's okay. No, there's, the standard is down. There's little or no accountability. Right? If we're not calling sin, sin, then we can get away with a lot of things. I think that's happening. They speak against the institutional church. Right? We don't want any of that old-time religion. Those guys are old. Old-time religion. But see, this is why church history is so important. Is there not a cloud of witnesses? looking down uh, Hebrews 11 and yelling at the church, go, keep going. Are we not attached to all of that? I understand there's, there's the, the, the legalism and things like that we want to separate from, but we're talking about who Christ is, the historical Christ. I believe there's only positive messages. I love positive messages. I know you do too, right? We want to hear of God's grace and His mercy, but we have to teach the whole counsel of God. There's times we come across Scripture, and I'll be honest, and I've said this before, this is a passage I'd rather skip, but here it is. It's in there. Holy Spirit's placed it in the Bible. We have to teach through it, all right? Paul says in Acts 20, 26, and 27, Therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men. For why? Why can he say that? I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. I'll say because that should be the conviction of your pastor and of your elders and of your leadership, the whole counsel of God. One more for you. I think uh, members in these churches regularly live an activity, practicing activity of sin without any accountability. Not only is it in the leadership, but it's through the congregation. We were hearing some time back of a real big mega church that did a, a survey and they found that that majority of the church was living in, in a high percentage in, in sexual uh, impurity and sexual immorality. Um, it was quite shocking. And the pastor's response was, basically to leave it alone, because he felt if we call them on it, they might leave. Proverbs twenty-eight eighteen says, Whoever walks blamelessly will be saved. He who pers- uh, pers- perseveres in, in his ways will suddenly, excuse me, perverse. But he who is perverse in his ways will suddenly fall. So we have this danger in our church. We look at per- Pergamos here and we say, man, what are they doing? I wish these guys would wake up. The doctrine of Balaam, are you serious? I mean, the, the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, I mean, these things are alive and well today. I just found a book. I've purchased it. I haven't read it. It's called The Doctrine of Balaam. They're writing against the abortion movement and the church's stand. It's alive and well. It's here, right? It hasn't gone anywhere. It might be repackaged differently, called something else. But they're here, and the church that doesn't compromise is a church that's aware of it church that understands it now there's a tendency for a lot of churches to say well we don't want to be on this end we don't you know we were all about grace but we're not that far and they'll swing the pendulum to the other side uh, which is equally wrong we don't want to be a legalistic church 
because that church is referenced in chapter 2, verses 1 through 7, as the loveless church, a church in Ephesus that forgets about Christ altogether. So you see the church has to walk in the middle, keeping legalism to one side and the hyper-grace to the other. Understand that you're free. You're absolutely free. God has given you such a wonderful gift. He loves you. He has bestowed His grace upon you. But we must come back to Scripture, follow after God, have a heart for Him. Today, what's happening in the church, the hyper grace, is just simply a church of universalism. Everything goes. That's where it's heading. That's the trajectory of where it's at. And they've, they've replaced, right, an uppercase God for a lowercase G, God. Purity is important in the church. That's our response to this, right? We can't control this God. He has a right to criticize. He has a right to call. He has a right to call us to repentance. We must take serious, going back to 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17, says this. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For if, excuse me, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God, abides forever you can almost hear the words jesus saying he who has ears let him hear i love the story of mark twain when uh, there was a businessman that he knew well he was a ruthless man who came to him and said you know one of my things i want to do in life is i want to go uh i want to travel to the holy land and i want to to uh, read the ten commandments from mount sinai i want to travel all around and do all those things and and uh um and read the Ten Commandments while I'm there. And Mark Twain, in his witty way, replied and said, you know, you could just stay in Boston and practice keeping the Ten Commandments. Right? Yeah, some of you are catching on to that. Too often we kind of think, well, you know, somebody, I, I, I like the Bible. I like the Word. And Christ is calling us to an intimate understanding of it, right? Come and engage. Follow after me. So we see that a a church that's not compromising is a church that's active. It's holy, right? And we have to be on guard. Paul is saying, hey, this this can happen to you. It can happen to me. Put your guard up. Uh, Number three, we also learn that a non-compromising church will practice discipline. Verse 16, repent or else I will come to you quickly and fight against them with the sword of my mouth. So here we see Jesus coming in short and telling them, practice church discipline, right? Here you have the Savior telling this church, look, in Matthew 18, I covered these things, right? Church discipline, do it, right? Remember, the first step of church discipline is you. If you're opening your Bible and you're a follower of Christ and you're reading it and you're coming to conviction and you're praying, saying, Lord, forgive me, guess what? That's church discipline. If you have an accountability partner or a friend who will hold you accountable and walk with you through all these things, and it says, look, this is sin and calling you out. That's church discipline. Church discipline happens often and a lot, doesn't it? You may have others who come to you and understand this, but hopefully something in your life, a sin that, 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 is, that is visual, doesn't come to a point where it's brought in front of the church. But that's how serious Jesus treats sin, right? He doesn't want to, to, to harm you, hurt you. You notice that through the, the rebuking of uh, the Nicolaitans, it's not the people, it's the doctrine, right? It's the teaching. You see the love of Christ, but he wants you to understand sin is real. We must come, be disciplined, call sin, sin, repent, right? And we have this or else, right? Repent or else I will come quickly and fight against them. How will he do this? With the sword of his mouth, he will speak truth. Now think on this for a moment. Jesus most likely is referencing uh, the end of destruction. When he comes at that time, there'll be no second chances, when they come the second time and they call and my word of truth that, that comes from the sword that comes from his mouth, when everything comes to a cultivation, there's not, not a moment there where we can say, hey, can I, have a, can I have just a moment? Can I get a second chance? There's no second chances at that moment. And Jesus says, when I come, they will be completely done away with. That's meant to be encouraging for the church. It's also meant to stir those who don't know Christ. Jesus began his earthly ministry with these words, Mark 1.15, right? The time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. It's important to Christ. So we must be disciplined. 
We also learn the last point here, verse 17, a non-compromising church will be rewarded. Stay the course, brothers and sisters. Right? There is a, a completion to our destiny. We are pilgrims traveling through. We know eternity is coming. He says, he who has an ear, let him hear. The Spirit says to the churches, hear, comprehend, have ears that are awake, have eyes that see. Understand the, the visual he talks about here, the, uh, the manna from heaven, right? And, and the stone, a new name, he's talking about eternal life. You will have eternal life. Stay the course. Fight the good fight. Be active in your pursuit. Be holy. Take sin seriously. Repent. Be disciplined. Understand, he has secured for you something you can never do. Christ is awesome. Closing here, I know I've gone over a little bit. Thank you for your patience. But application, application, what do we do? How do we take this and just kind of put it into action and keep it going? The letter A here is Christ has the right. You have to know this. Christ has the right to criticize and command repentance. If you struggle against that today, I would question whether you, you understand or have salvation, that you have Christ. Because we come to the cross and we see what he has done. We see how he loves you. Why would our response be, he has no right to tell me what I can and can't do? See, the believer looks upon the, Christ and, uh, excuse me, upon the cross and we see uh, grace, we see mercy. It's a Savior that loves me. The world looks upon the cross and sees judgment. Right? Somebody telling me how I have to live my life. Their neck is stiff. I'm going to be like God. You're not going to tell me what I can and can't do. But the believer sees it and it's precious to him. Christ has that right. Uh, letter B, the person who thinks lightly of sin thinks lightly of God. Right? I love a little book that Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones wrote, uh, uh, Evangelicalism. It's simply the, the thesis of that as an evangelical is a, a person of the book. Right? Is it open? Is your nose in it? Keep reading it, right? Think highly of God's holiness. Think highly of who God is. Be serious about sin. You take sin lightly, you take God lightly. Uh, let her see. Christ is pleased when we demonstrate a genuine attitude of repentance from sin. I believe he's very encouraged when you and I come and say, Lord, forgive me. Help me to forsake this sin. Help me to denounce it. I've been struggling with it. Uh, as the psalmist says, revive me, right? Psalms 119, revive me. Let your, your statutes, your law, your word, your precepts, let it be precious to me. Incline my heart to follow after you. Maybe this week as you review this, this message, man, we'll go back and read that psalm, those eight verses that we read this morning. And in letter D, all who overcome and persevere in this life will receive eternal life. We know Christ has, has secured that for us. We know he has done that. Be confident in it. When there's moments of life, and I know you're human, I'm human, and there's moments where we think, even like David, where we say, where are you? What are you doing? What is going on? It feels like everything's crumbling down. It feels like I'm, I'm dealing with all this opposition and all this pain, this sorrow. Know that there, there's a day, there's a definitive day in history where all this will be wrapped up. And you'll have a new name, a new name in glory, a resurrected body. Right? Know that. Hold firmly, brothers and sisters, God's truth. We see the heartbeat of Paul as a pastor telling this church, look, fight temptation, flee from idolatry. We see Jesus saying, look, you're, you're fighting, you're, you're doing the good thing. This is what I have against you. Idolatry has made its way into your church. Fight it, repent of it. Call it what it is, right? Practice discipline and know that there is a day coming where all this will be fixed. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your goodness, God, your grace today. You are awesome. You are incredible. And I know, Lord, this morning we might have been challenged by this, this message, and, and I pray that we would learn these lessons from uh, this church in Revelation. I pray that you would help us, if we're not, to become active, uh, Lord, in, in, our, in our walk after you, in our pursuit after you. Uh, Lord, we pray over even our outreach activities. We pray over our Awana next Sunday, Lord, going out. Uh, we pray that even you would be preparing and uh, hearts to have conversations. Uh, Lord, prepare us for the activity of, of, of uh, sharing with others in the workplace, where we go, what we do. Prepare us. Let us be a church that's active in our discipleship and active, Lord, in evangelism. 
I pray, God, for us individually that you would help us in our purity. Uh, guard us from what we see, as the psalmist said, Lord, t- turn my eyes away from, from worthless things. Let us be careful what we see, what we ponder. I pray, God, that you would turn our eyes, our hearts to you. Let us, let us pursue purity and holiness, that we would not compromise. I pray, Lord, that we would take sin seriously when it creeps in. When, when, Lord, we have those bad days and we might fail, I ask that we would take seriously what Jesus is commanding us to do, to repent. He began his earthly ministry with telling us to repent. He is telling the church after he has resurrected over and overcome this world, he's telling the church to repent. Lord, there is something that Jesus understands that we have sinned, we need to repent. Lord, let us take sin seriously. Let us realize what Christ has done. Let us realize that Christ understands the difference between right and wrong. And, and it's tempting in our day to gray it, to make it uh, things pass or not be as severe. But clearly Jesus has said and told us there are things that need to be done. There are things that need to stop. And so, Lord, guide us with that. And I pray, Lord, in those difficult days and moments that you would just remind us of eternity with you. Remind us of heaven. Remind us, Lord, that you have open arms. Remind us of the cloud of witnesses that are cheering us to keep going. Let us look upon history and upon your word and upon uh, all the different elements and the heroes. Lord, let us be reminded that you have set good works in front of us to do. And let us we do them, let our eyes be upon heaven. Let us give attention to the details of life. Let us be a light that shines, that you would be glorified. We'd see lives come, Lord, to know Christ as their Savior. And so I add again our community. I add again, Lord, our families. I add again those who we are witnessing to. Lord, let us be at work, uh, both in, in life and in word, for your glory, for your kingdom. Lord, let us be a church that holds, fir- holds firmly your truth. And we love you. We pray this in the wonderful and awesome name of our Savior, our Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen.